like so many things today that are really great, it started out with Facebook, right? <laughs> Adrian Grenier posted about plastics in the ocean, and somehow it ended up on my feed. I looked up the nonprofit he co-founded, The Lonely Well, and promptly sent an email asking if he'd like to come to Cabrillo Marine Aquarium Sustainable Seafood Expo. To my surprise and delight, he said yes. So, <laughs> Adrian's an actor, filmmaker, musician, and social good advocate. As an actor, he's best known for playing A-list movie star Vincent Chase in the HBO smash hit Entourage. But he's also a passionate environmental activist who supports organizations focused on habit changing education, including the Shift Mobile Kitchen Classroom and the Lonely Well Foundation. He's a social good advocate on behalf of Dale, championing healthier, eco-friendly choices through digital storytelling and advocacy. Earlier this year, the United Nations made Adrian a social program goodwill ambassador. We're really proud of him for that. So please join me in welcoming our special guest, Adrian Grenier. <clears throat> Hello, boys and girls. Ah, <sighs> you know, I, I have to say that doing this work with the oceans is such a treat. When I started thinking about where I wanted to put my focus, I started to think about where where do I want to spend my days? Where do I want my, where do I want my office to be? And the ocean seemed like a pretty damn good place. <laughs> Um, I do, I love our ocean, I love the sea, I love the water. It's such an important aspect to our lives that we uh, often take for granted, at the very least. And often in this society, we, we actually l lob a lot of destructive attacks on it. So the fact that we're all here today and that we're starting to, to look at practical ways that we can start to elevate our seafood industry to become more sustainable, I think is going to really give us an opportunity to um, make those transitions to a more thoughtful, sustainable lifestyle. And that's really what it's all about for me. It's about not going to any extreme, right? You know, in the extremes we often break. We can't, we can't absorb, we can't, um, we can't really adopt those changes because it's just too much all at once. So I always advocate, you know, let's do things together so that we can get a, a wide swath, a massive length of, of energy and effort. Uh, and let's just take, take little baby steps. Let's take little uh, achievable steps to, to reach our bigger collective goals. Because really, you can't take the weight of the world on your personal shoulders. You can't. People try, but there's, there's an arrogance to that. You're gonna save us? No, no, we gotta do it together. We really do require uh, a global community effort to, to tackle some of these problems. And, um, and by the way, it's a lot more fun when you do it together. <laughs> right? So we gotta take small steps. And that's when uh, we started thinking about this big, enormous issue called plastic pollution in the ocean. 10 million tons every year bleeds into the ocean. 10 million tons ends up in the, in the oceans and it's uh, killing our fish, it's ending up on our beaches, that's annoying. Ruining our Sundays on the beach. And then it's ending up in our fish that we eat. And then it's ruining our health. So marrying these two things, right, trying to tackle the big problems and also thinking baby steps. How do we tackle, how do we, how do we begin to approach this 10 million tons of plastic? Well, we, we came up with a solution, or at least a suggestion. We thought, well, why don't we take straw-sized steps? So we started a campaign for a strawless ocean. We're not asking anybody to do anything extreme. 
totally transform your lifestyle. Do things that are unrealistic because what happens when people attempt to do something and then they ultimately fail because it's just uncer uh, uh, like it's too big? They give up. So we don't want that. We, we, want, we want something that people can actually do successfully on a daily basis, feel a sense of success and achievement, and then build from there. So, so the single-use plastic straw is this opportunity. It's this, this, this entrance into a, a bigger world, a bigger opportunity. It's um, a gateway, if you will. It's sort of the easiest thing. It's a low-hanging plastic. It's like just something that anybody and everybody, we encounter plastic straws regularly, every day, all of us. They end up in our drinks at, uh, you know, when we get our coffee in the morning and then end up in our drinks when we have lunch. And then, of course, we go out at night and have a couple cocktails and then probably 20, 20 straws. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> so we started this, uh, this campaign against single-use plastic straws. And for us, we are like, okay, now how do we reach as many people as possible? So what we did was um, we started looking at our business in, in oceans and uh, in nonprofit work, uh, not, not as a marginalized, bastardized, non-for-profit, but really as a business. And so how do business operate? What would businesses do to get your attention in a world when there's so much distraction? So we decided that we were going to really put a lot of energy, a lot of effort into the marketing. And so we actually, we employed a marketing company. And we sat for several months and we developed a campaign, a real commercial-like campaign with all the different, um, you know, different pillars that you have to achieve with measurable uh, goals and accountability. We wanted to actually hit some real numbers. And by the way, we had an opportunity to actually start to count, to sort of keep track, because with the straw, we can actually start to figure out what kind of impact we're actually making. It's not just feel good, esoteric, intangible change. We're actually able to tell you how much change we are actually creating in the world. And not just us. Now, you can actually, on a daily basis, you can count how many straws you say no to. And on average, we, each, each individual uses two straws on average a day. So you know what, it's easy too. If, if you refuse two single-use plastic straws a day, you would essentially be single-use plastic straw free. You would not be part of the problem anymore. But then you could take it one step further. You tell a friend, get them to refuse single-use plastic straws. Give them some dirty looks when they're <laughs> slurping away on those plastic straws. You could even go further. You could. Go to your local business, or restaurant, venue, favorite bar. Talk to the manager. Get them to go single-use plastic straw. So we started to build these, these tools in conjunction with a media campaign, commercials, if you will, so that not only we could have that reach and we could start to really get people's attentions and bring them into this conversation, but then we wanted to make sure that we'd give them the tools so that they could go out make personal change, and then make local change. And then together, we start to put the pressure on the bigger companies, the international companies, and that's next. That's actually what we're working on right now. So our campaign, who's seen it? Show of hands. Our, can our campaign for Astralis Oceans is called Stop Sucking. <laughs> It's not funny, we all suck. <laughs> Since when did sucking become like a funny thing? Like, anybody ever said that I sucked, I'd be offended. But it's true, we all suck. You all suck. <laughs> and we gotta stop it, we gotta cut it out. We gotta stop sucking. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Stop sucking. 
That's right. <laughs> because we use 500 million plastic straws every single day. 500 million every day. Every 24 hours, 500 million just in the United States alone. Just in our little world, in our little bubble. That's not around the world. I did some rough estimates. Uh, don't, don't quote me on this, but I think they're relatively accurate. It wouldn't be unreasonable to say that globally we use one trillion annually. So it's a, it's a problem that is, is a big problem, and it's just a, a smidge of the 10 million tons that we bleed into the ocean every year. Um, but we can start actually making some real changes. So again, in, within this philosophy of straw size steps, just, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> we said, all right, so now we could just do this wide sweeping campaign and just expect everybody to come on board or we could, we could even narrow it down in our effort. So we decided we were gonna launch Strawless in Seattle. Yes. <laughs> you guys are funny. Good humor, I like it. Most comedians don't get this kind of a response. I love it. Um, so, so we decided we were going to start city by city, and we were going to we were going to launch our pilot program in Seattle, and we were going to see. All right, if we if we can get people to to make personal choice change, um, can we actually get a whole city all at once to? make at least an overture, just to, just to acknowledge that, yeah, you know what, we do suck. Maybe they'll just acknowledge it, and then we can you know, make a, a goal down, down the road to actually make some real change. So we launched Strawless in Seattle, and I don't think we really expected to have as much success as we did, but we managed to get 200 plus restaurants to sign up and stop sucking in the month of September. Uh, yeah. Safeco Field, the stadium, also Seattle Seahawks Stadium. The Space Needle, and the airport. At the tune of two million straws removed from the waste stream just in the month of Seattle. But that's not just in September, that's every year, every month, forever. So you do the math. <clears throat> so that's Strawless in Seattle. Now we're looking to take our next step, and our next step is going to be Strawless Cities, so we're going to um, launch a campaign coming up pretty soon where we're gonna ask people to suggest which city we should go to next. And of course, it's not gonna be one city, but it's gonna be many, many, many cities as we grow. And as, as we start to bring in people to, um, to our little pod, we, uh, we think that we're gonna grow a lot faster. We're gonna, like, like any good business, we're gonna scale exponentially and just become um, a lot bigger than, than just one person one town, one city, but really uh, we, we hope eventually that we can eliminate all of those single-use plastic straws, which I think is very, 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 very possible. So um, does anybody know some of this, like the, the, I mean, I just assume that you guys all are woke already, right? Like if you guys know what's going on, we're all here, and, and to, to a large degree we are the choir, so if, um, should we do like a four-part harmony? No? <laughs> One, one of the, the stats that really upset me was, I think there's like 11, 1100, 11, no, 11,000 tiny bits of plastic that pass through a, a, an individual, a human being, every year. 11,000, is that every year? From seafood, yeah, from seafood. That goes into seafood, so when plastic, and I'll just, I'll just talk to you those that maybe are just strolling in from the street. Um, so plastic doesn't biodegrade, it takes you know, 500 plus years. So not in your lifetime, not your kids lifetimes, your kids kids, your kids kids kids, like 10 grand kids down. Uh, great, 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 great grandkids. 
they'll still be eating the fish that are ingesting the plastic that you throw away today, right? So when this plastic that doesn't biodegrade, but it actually just photodegrades and it's weather degrades, it starts to break down into tinier pieces. They're small and often microscopic, but they are still the plastic bond. So there's, it's still plastic substance. And so what happens is it's not just this big island of you know, physical mass of plastic out in the ocean. It's actually this marsh, this soup of toxic plastic. And all the fish are in there, and they're passively absorbing this plastic because how do they eat? They open their mouth, and they take in the food that they're looking to eat plus a lot of extra water that contains this plastic material. Often, because of the way the pl plastic operates, uh, it starts to attach algae and different um, smells and substances so that fish actually also start to identify that as food. And then it's not just passive, now they're actively going and eating it. So because of this, 60 plus percent of fish are gonna have uh, plastic in their, in their systems. Um, of course, 70% of seabirds uh, and that's just going to keep increasing as we dump more plastic. And then, of course, if we want to have sustainable seafood, we're going to, that's, how, that's not sustainable, right? I mean, plastic and fish and that we eat is not sustainable. So I think there's definitely something that we need to look at. It's not just about fishing practices, and it's not just about um, letting our fisheries replenish and, and, and have a chance to, to become robust so that we can feed the billion people that eat seafood, that could eat seafood every day for a healthy protein. But also we, get, we really have to look at the plastic problem because that is going to really just turn everything on its head if we can't, if we can't cut it off. So I'd like to do a little something here. Um, oh, look at that. Well, I'm gonna play you the PSA. Maybe I should play the PSA first. Let's play the PSA. And then I'm going to do something after that, if that's OK. I suck. I may not look like I suck, but I do. Ban Jones sucks. I've been sucking on TV since I was 10. Everywhere I could suck, I would suck. I've sucked in over 90 countries. Democrats, Republicans, independents, we all suck. You know who else sucks? Kendrick Sampson. <laughs> I'm Kendrick Sampson, and I suck. We suck together. Sure, I've sucked, but Yuna sucks even more. Yuna sucks. And I suck. And I suck. And I suck. When someone tweets, I suck, I'm like, I know. Statistically speaking, most of us suck. Most of us suck every day. Suck, suck, suck. Suck. Today, you probably used one of these. 500 million plastic straws are used in this country every single day. Day. And many end up in the ocean, polluting water and killing sea life. If we don't act now, by 2050, there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish. You know, like you go snorkeling, you look down, and you don't see fish, you see plastic. But there's something you can do about I it. I will stop sucking. I will stop sucking. We will all stop sucking. We will all stop sucking. If you do. Hashtag stop sucking. Okay, so admit it. How many of you suck? Uh-huh. How many of you have sucked today? All right, not, not that bad, not that bad. That's good. You knew you were coming here. But how many of you will pledge to stop sucking right now? Okay, everybody stand up. Come on. Come on. Hashtag stop sucking. I'm holding you to it. 
So you guys did this here right now, but what I would love for you to do is go on social and make the same pledge. Do a video. Uh, if, if you need some tools, we have on strawlessoceans.org. We have little different tools that you can make pictures and, and make a post and tell the world. Make the declaration. I... I, stop, I, I, I pledge to stop sucking. And then you can also challenge someone else if there's someone that you know is a, is a, is a notorious sucker. <laughs> or a local business. Or my favorite right now, since we were in Seattle and um, they didn't come on board, was uh, Starbucks. You could actually uh, hashtag Starbucks, hashtag stop sucking, if you want. <laughs> they use two billion every year, by the way. Two billion. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, I don't know if if, uh, if it's time for a little Q and A, but uh, m m shall we do? So we're gonna do a Q and A. Let's do a Q and A. So while we're waiting for Caroline, of course she's here. Um, Adrian, I have a quick question. Now that with this new am ambassadorship that you have, by the way, congratulations. Thank you. Um, you're starting. You're probably starting to hear kind of the, the, not only the national view of this, but the international view. So how are international colleagues and friends dealing with this? Yeah, so it's been a, a great opportunity just to expand my personal awareness of uh, not only some of the uh, unique ocean issues that are, are troubling some local places around the world, but also how businesses internationally and how governments and uh, local muni municipalities around the world are trying to solve for it. So it's just given me an opportunity to start to interface with some of these uh, NGOs and governments and, and really start to bring them together to help do what we do and bring this um, idea of levity and, and fun and, and really um, commercial scale promotion to uh, to our oceans because they need a good they need a good marketing team, and so we've actually been asked the Lonely Well Foundation has been asked to um, come in and take over the marketing for the UN Environment Program for their Clean Seas campaign. So I'm going to get a jump start on that and say hashtag Clean Seas because <laughs> we're coming we're we're going to start doing that. Great, great. Okay, so I'm going to tell on you. I was standing over there and I saw you sucking. <laughs> but I have a feeling there's a special straw, so can you tell us a little bit about some of the alternative straws that you're working with? So it's really funny, I, you know, um, this whole idea of manifestation, right? when you start to think about how you want your life to be, and you start to meditate on it, and you start to put out intentions, slowly but surely you'll, you'll find that those thoughts manifest into reality. And it's not this you know, hippy-dippy thing, it's actually real, because in ways that, you, um, that, that make a lot of sense, actually. For example, uh, my Instagram feed. When I started doing this work and I started putting out my energy out there and I started to seek like-minded people who were doing ocean work and who were f looking to solve some of these problems, I started to follow them. And now, whenever I scroll through my feed, my world is speaking back to me and it's all uh, Paul Nicklins and ocean photographers and uh, Sylvia Earls and, and ocean conservationists and marine biologists and a great number of amazing companies who are the solution. So Simply Straws, I follow them on Instagram. Uh, Kofi uh, is, is a new, actually I just started following them recently, another uh, alternative. Um, of course Aardvark which uh, is, is a straw company that we uh, hold dear to ourselves. Um, and, and it's really great because I start to realize, man, we are a growing community and we don't have to be distracted by all of the ugliness and darkness out there and all the pretty shiny things. We can start to, to really connect with those around us that are doing real meaningful work that make our lives truly better. So let me expound on that a little bit. We have, um, if you haven't been around to see all the exhibits, uh, Simply Straws has a glass straw that you can buy and carry around in your purse, or maybe a little harder for the men, I'm not sure how you do that. But, um, 
carry the straw around with you and use it when you simply have to have a straw. There's a straw company out there that makes um, straws from harvested rye. It's just oh, yes. the, the, the rye. The harvest straws. Right. And then there's Aardvark, which is the paper straws. And they've improved them over the years so that they stand up for as long as you're going to be drinking the drink. So um, the, the whole initiative when you go to a restaurant say, no straw for me. But if you simply have to have one, if they offer you a paper straw or some other material, of course, that's much better than a plastic straw that might end up in the ocean. Yeah. And in fact, if you go to strawlessocean.org backslash alternatives, <laughs> we provide all of the different opportunities you can, you, you, all the different alternatives you uh, have available to make those changes. And also take those to your local restaurants and say, look, we've actually negotiated some good um, prices for you as well so that restaurants don't have that like extreme added burden of extra cost because you know some of these te uh, technologies, some of these products, because they don't have the same scale that plastic does, um, are still struggling a little bit to get the price down. So the more we use them, the better they can do on the price, and we've actually helped to, to bring it down initially. And that's the economy of this country, is that as we make good choices for things that we want to happen, they become l less expensive because of the, the number that people are buying. So these are all messages that if we take them to heart and, and again, uh, make our choice and make sure that the people that we buy things from know what our choices are, uh, we're going to make a difference. And that's why uh, having that pledge today about stop sucking, thank you so much for that. Uh, that's how we get started, folks. And you being here today, big, big help. Thank you so much. Uh, but one of the things I wanted to pull out of this is that I have an 84-year-old mother that will not have a soda without a straw, even if it's in a can. <laughs> So um, these alternatives are really powerful for, for folks that she just wants to have her straw. That, that's what, the way she's always done it. And well, I mean, there's some real reasons why people use straws. And then there are just some um, you know, finicky, personal, idiosyncratic reasons. It's, you know, there, there are lipstick reasons. There are uh, germophobia reasons. Uh, and then some people in the disability community actually need them uh, exactly. because of, of what they're going through. So it's great that we do have these alternatives. There's, there's glass, there's metal, there's straw straws, there's paper. There, there are alternatives so that there really isn't an, ex an excuse anymore. So last time we saw you had just been swimming in the ocean with Richard Branson. And we know you've oh, yes. been diving with Sylvia Earle. What's, what's next for you? What's the next adventure? Well, uh, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, I'm going down to Antarctica to swim huh. with Paul Nicklin. Wow, very good. <laughs> Remember I was saying about the office? You know how sometimes you go to the office and it's really cold? <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> Watch it. <laughs> uh, but no, it's, it, it's going to be an incredible opportunity to, to go down there and see the work that he's been doing. And, um, and, I, and, I, and I intend to swim in uh, as many different oceans as I possibly can. I've really taken to s swimming generally and, uh, of course, scuba diving and that sort of thing. So looking forward to that. And please tune in uh, to see that shrinkage. <laughs> 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 or not see that shrink, no. <laughs> Adrian, in your, uh, your swims, I'm glad that was brought up. Do, do, you, do you see a lot of plastic? I mean, is it something that you, you notice? Yeah, I, you know, when I did the swim with Richard Branson, it was in the Mediterranean, not cold. It was actually quite nice, i got to say. But it was in the Mediterranean, which is 85% overfished. 85%. And it's the Mediterranean. What do you think of when you think of the Mediterranean? You think like a nice fish with the olive oil. Like you think of all that <laughs> stuff. But they got no fish over there. It's crazy. So I was, we were swimming. It was an hour and 45 minute journey across the Strait of Messina, which is, for those of you that don't know, it's between the boot and the ball, between Sicily and uh, the mainland Italy. Um, and, I, and I didn't see any fish, not one fish. Not a single fish. But what I did see was lots of plastic. Band-aids and plastic bags and little bits of un, you know, undescript, indescript uh, plastic. And it was, it was very upsetting, I have to say. But um, you know, every stroke, as difficult as it was, was full of purpose because I knew I could see why I was doing it. So that's why you know, we encourage everybody to get out there and get in the ocean. 
Um, it, it can be sometimes scary and daunting, but really there's nothing to be scared of that is natural in the ocean. The only thing to really be scared of is what's unnatural. That's what we put in there. So get out there and connect with the, the, the laws of the ocean and the, and the animals there. And when you can connect, you start to build the caring, the empathy. Uh, otherwise, it's just this abstract thing that's over there that you know, is, doesn't relate to you. Um, I just wanted to say that um, I know the effort in Seattle was uh, in large part uh, in conjunction with the Seattle Aquarium, and we are part of a collaborative here. Um, Mike always talks about this amazing statistic that more people go to zoos and aquariums than go to all of the major sports arenas um, every year. I don't remember the number, 180 million? 180 million people yeah. go to zoos and aquariums in this country, and that's more than the, than the four major sports when right. you put them all together, football, baseball. Basketball, hockey. <laughs> so, so we really um, are trying to be a trusted resource and we're trying to um, walk the walk along with, um, and not just lecture folks. Um, can you hold up that curtain really high? We carry these in the, um, in the gift shop now instead of plastic bottles. And if you notice today, all the serving pieces are made out of fallen palm fronds or bamboo. Even the, what looks like a plastic fork or a plastic cup is made out of um, veg vegetable matter. Um, so we're really trying to do that. And, and we thank you for being part of that and, and encouraging us because we thought, oh, if we're gonna have Adrian here, we have to be really careful and not have, <laughs> we don't want a sock. Uh, so. We appreciate your help with that. Well, I appreciate that as well. But, you know, it, aquariums have traditionally been the, the place that people connect to the oceans because not everybody can get out there. Uh, so it's, an impor it's important work to, for education. And now it's not just education about the fish that we uh, admire and the, the wildlife that we're in awe of and, and the science and, and all the, the technology, but now it's also about conservation and that has to be necessarily a part of the conversation with, uh, with, that aquariums have with their audience because uh, it's, it's important that, you know, I, ironically, I'm sure, you know, you go around and you'll, you know, one thing that's always frustrated me is there's not coordination amongst like-minded conservationists and education groups where you might have a plastic bottle in the gift shop without even thinking about it, without even necessarily making that connection. But you know, it's important that we reach outside of our own little scope of work and we start to try and support others that are doing related work and that we help each other. Um, because this is the place where all those people are going to learn not only about you know, the, the way fish operate and how they, they work, but also all these conservation opportunities. And you know, Adrian, having you here today with the Lonely Fit Whale Foundation shows that kind of collaboration. Also, just a week ago, the aquarium uh, has joined the Aquarium Conservation Partnership, which was started two years ago by the Monterey Bay Aquarium, the Shedd Aquarium in Chicago, and the National Aquarium in Baltimore. And they have been trying to get the aquariums of the nation to kind of join together and, and uh, to have common messages. Because although we all talk about these things, it's so much more powerful when you're hearing the same message here at Cabrillo Marine Aquarium, as you hear at the Monterey Bay Aquarium, as you hear at the National Aquarium, as you hear at the Shedd Aquarium, as you hear at all the aquariums that we have. That's where the power is. And that's what you're talking about when you talk about us banding together and making sure that people are hearing these in a common voice. Yeah. And although it's very difficult to do because there's a lot of issues, uh, that's the beginning. Well, and what the real power is, is when you start speaking up and you let your local government know what matters to you so that they can start putting the clamps down on some of this unfettered business that really doesn't care about the oceans doesn't really care about our health. They care about making money, but not about the things that are really important that are sustainable in terms of our life. Great. Okay. I think we have um, time for maybe one or two questions. Anybody have a back there? So for those of us who are here who are marine biologists, who have been you know, working towards projects, conservation, dedicated ourselves towards it, what would you say would be the best way to get in touch with you or really with anyone who has leverage to make what we want to be known known. 
something that we think important to be known as important? What would be the most effective way to go about that? <clears throat> I think some of the biggest obstacles to collaboration and working together is just infrastructure, right? The tools, the, 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 just the practical ways in which we communicate. Uh, it, it, it can be daunting. It could be a full-time job sometime. But then, in terms of more specifically, what specifically? Like, would Instagram be the most effective platform or reaching out to our local legislature? And this is, and this is coming from, you know, personal experience from, I'm sure, a lot of us, because we've done all of that. And there are some really pressing issues that we don't feel have been capitalized on, as some other ones have. How do we, how do we kind of make this a holistic effort from everyone as opposed to just those who have figured out how to get in touch with the people who have a voice? Well, we really do have to organize better, 100%. That's something that we're, we talk about all the time and we're looking to solve for. We need to uh, figure out a way that, again, we can have a unified message, that we don't bicker um, amongst ourselves about where we should be putting our energy or focus or uh, you know, getting into the de details and the facts even. Like, I mean, I, the facts are important, but we know the facts. So if somebody tries to argue the facts, don't waste your time. Talk about your values. Talk about your human values, your humanness. That's something they can't argue with. So I think we need to stop letting the divisive um, tactics of those that just want to derail our efforts and, and divide us as opposed to us unifying. They're working when we start to get distracted by the details. So I think you know, one thing that we really want to do is start to, and that was, that was part of our mission is, and I saw it for years in conservation, where you had these siloed efforts, nobody communicating, and also I wanted to get involved and nobody utilized me, no one used me. I was like, I'm ready to fight, like what do I do? I gotta do something, I'm ready to work. So we're, we're trying to solve that and on one of our cornerstones of, of the foundation is radical collaboration. So I would say, you know, you may not be able to Work with everybody, but work with one other organization. Maybe find one that's on the other side of the country, or find somebody that does something opposite from you so that you can uh, complement each other. Um, and, and then if you can bring in someone else, great. But the idea is do it with one other person, one other organization, or more, and start there. And if, I think one day uh, soon there, there will be some larger tools, but you can use social media as, as a tool. Um, certainly Instagram, I use Instagram all the time. I respond to all, all the messages that are uh, related to conservation in the oceans. Not so much the entourage ones, but sometimes. <laughs> um, but yeah, hit me up. And you know another thing I think which, which is important for all of us that have been trying to do this is persistence that uh, what you do right now and what we're doing right now uh, needs to not stop uh, until you finally get to a point where things have got some momentum and now have lived. And sometimes, uh, I'll use an example, that even here at the aquarium when we educate kids over the years and tell them that the ocean is a pretty terrible place because of what we've done to it, uh, we've got to remember that there are some wins there along the way also. How many of you realize that the Port of Los Angeles is a much cleaner place than it used to be? Much cleaner. Now, I, I'm not trying to uh, minimize the importance of plastics. Plastics have actually become a bigger challenge for us. And it's not across the board. But it's a much cleaner place than it used to be. Uh, we still have grunion running on this beach right out here. We still have bottlenose dolphins coming by. We have pelicans that are flying again. Um, gray whales are now uh, as high as they ever were in, in many respects. Uh, they're off the endangered species list. We have some wins, but it took a lot to get those wins. And one of the qualities that I think all of those wins had was persistence. So you're going to have to be in it for the long haul. And then when you're ready to move away from that, you're going to have to be recruiting the next person to take up that standard and move it on because that's what makes a difference, folks. So thank you so much.
and I'm sorry, I can't, I can't let this go, but how did Seattle beat us to the punch? Come on, you guys. Everybody stop sucking and talk to your elected officials and Do you guys make be your next? personal choices. Yeah. We're next. You want to be next? We're next. Okay. Thank you so much, Adrian, Thanks, for taking guys. the time. Thank we appreciate you. it.